All right. Uh, I want to welcome uh, Ben Conant to the Founders Fireside show. I guess this is a show now, and um, and so so welcome to the show and and uh, and to the audience who I'm sure is building up. Uh, welcome as well. Um, ben is a full stack uh, full stack academy alum uh, who's done some you know who's led I, I would say a really interesting life before full stack and and uh, even you know maybe even more interesting. I don't know how you define interesting, but life afterward and has uh, accomplished some really uh, great things, something, you know, things to be proud of. And so we want to hear from Ben and uh, also learn about his lessons um, and advice for um, full stackers, for others. And so welcome Ben to the show and uh, great to have you. Thank you. It's, it's great to, great to be here. Um, and so, so I, I, I'm, I'm curious if, if you just want to give us a quick kind of background of, of, um, of what were you doing before? How did you decide to learn how to code? How, you know, how did this whole path to tech start? Yeah. Um, so for me, it, it actually it started in college. Uh, I I went to Vassar College and I I, I applied like for some reason thinking that I was going to be an art history person. Like in high school, I was like, art history is is what is what I need to do. Um, that lasted for about uh, three months. Um, I did not like that, um, and I was trying to figure out what I what I did want to do. I, I got into economics, which led into math, um, and kind of the combination of economics, math, and philosophy, which was my other sort of major, really led me down to computer science, right? As mm -hmm. kind of a combination of, of all those things, or at least that's what it felt like to me. So through doing computer science at Vassar, meeting some of the people there. And having all these challenges, like processing a lot of data for some econometrics class, or thinking about, you know, um, some sociology problem in, in terms of like, well, how could an algorithm solve this, or an ethics problem in terms of how would an algorithm solve this? I really just got the computer science bug. I was never like a formal algorithms person or a formal like computer architecture person. Um, I always just liked building things. Uh, and so I got really down that path in school. I think at the end of school, like I, I didn't, it wasn't appealing to me to try and do the junior engineer straight out of college thing. Um, I think it felt yeah. a little bit like constraining or like it, it would just, it just felt like this is not, I'm not ready to like make that, that commitment uh, in my life. And so I was searching around for things to do. Um, and what I landed on was Teach for America seems really appropriate. I, I had done some tutoring and, and stuff in school. I really liked teaching. Um, so I, I got into Teach for America. I taught in Newark, New Jersey. I taught sixth and seventh grade math. Um, and this was actually at a startup school. So this was back when all of the Zuckerberg money was going into Newark. Um, okay. and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation also got involved and they funded this school. Um, that was By the way, is that money run out now or do they like you're saying back when well i think there was a huge infusion um of cash i don't think it's run out it was like 100 million or something i remember that figure at least yeah it was i think all and you know there are people who actually know the answer to this question but all in with zuckerberg and, and the follow-on and, and all of the interest in charter schools i think it was like 250 million or something that went into charter school development in new york um and I got a job at this school that was actually doing something called blended learning, which is computers driving the content and teaching the lessons, especially in, in math, and then teachers pulling data and trying to pull small groups and act as tutors, right? Yeah. It's more like an adult learning model applied, applied to middle school, you get off of the whiteboard. Um, so it was a little bit of like a hybrid teaching and, and engineering role because I was consolidating lots of different data from lots of different ed tech platforms, which like apparently everything else in the world, like there's siloed code, there's siloed software, there's siloed data, and, and nothing really integrates uh, particularly well if you're trying to get like an actual thing done. Um, so that was great. I, I really enjoyed the engineering side of it. I enjoyed starting and coaching this basketball team at the school. Like that was a lot of fun, um, but I did not, nice. I just did not like teaching math. Um, so that was sort of where I was at. And I decided to really go down the engineering path and was looking around for like after the two years of TFA, like what's the next step? 
And that's when full stack kind of came onto my radar. Um, I think I tried to start a number of different companies where software was involved before I went to full stack. Um, but you know, it, it was appealing because it was like, okay, this is the modern stack. This is what people are looking for. I can maybe make money as a contractor if I know these skills. Um, so right. let me take this course and, and then I'll figure it out later. I mean, I, I remember even as a early student at full stack, like you were, I felt like your eyes were always on like entrepreneurship. Um, and I think you always had that like vision. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what your short term plan was, but it, it felt to me like you were like full of ideas. You're like always wanting to talk, talk, talk shop, you know, about ideas. Yeah, I think I think that really started in college. Like I built some cool projects with some friends I had. One of them was a like a, a game that combined um, Xbox Connect and like a kind of a Mario thing um, where, you know, you're, you're actually jumping to like move the the, the sprite around the screen. Um, and then we kind of took that code and translated it into a thing where you're actually pointing at a cup on a table and a robotic arm picks up the cup that you're pointing. So these sort of projects, like that sort of lit me on fire a little bit. Like that, I always think back to those days um, and I'm like, wow, like that's when I knew what I wanted to do. Like I wanted to work on technology stuff with other smart people and, and try to get as ambitious with it um, as I can. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And so, so, so then you you went through full stack. Um, I don't remember what your rank was in your class. Okay, I'm just kidding. We don't actually have. Yeah, class I, don't, class. I was unaware that there was a ranking system of any kind. <laughs> oh, there's a, no. I, I I I wouldn't say there's there's not any formal ranking. I feel like we always have an idea of like uh, academic ranking. But I, I I was just kidding. But 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 like you know. So after you graduated, what what made you know like when people are graduating from full stack there's this feeling that um first off we do a lot of training towards you know interview prep and like just career success and there's this constant feeling that you know i gotta get my resume together i'm gonna start applying to jobs like we're, we're showing you there's hiring day where you have a lot of your meeting companies so it's like like what made you want to you know work on a just like a business idea instead of at least you know go out there and, and find a job so or I, did you look for a job for something? Yeah. Huh? So, so I I became a fellow after um after full stack. That's right. That was really my only goal for the second half of like I didn't really care about. It. I just wanted to be a fellow because I thought that was cool. I really enjoyed yeah being at full stack and and even looking back like it's been many years now. But I think I really felt like I found a home and I just like didn't want to leave. Um, so that's why I wanted to be a fellow. Um, and then as a fellow, eventually it became clear that I was going to have to go take my next step. Um, and, uh, so I applied to some jobs. Um, there, there were, a, it was, it was cool. Like I, I felt very prepared. I, I had a, a, a number of offers that I was just thinking about. And, and the one that I ended up choosing was this sort of blockchain um, startup, uh, in the city, which is now, you know, uh, a series, series B company. I mean, it was very, very early. It was the CTO, the CEO. And, and I was like, okay, the, okay. My bad. So you did, so you did, uh, you, you did, you did start a job, right? Yeah. I started a job at a very early stage blockchain company where I was okay. like, I was like a junior engineer coming in, but I was also like engineer number one. Um, so I see. So it's almost like founding a company, like yeah. At that level. I mean, what well, I was not a founder. I didn't really know anything about blockchain that much at the time. Um, I remember sure. visiting you. This was a Symbiont or something, right? Symbiont, yeah. Symbiont. I remember visiting you, and you guys were working on some really interesting stuff. And I think Ben was showing me like his dev environment, and he had like different nodes running on his machine, and like. Yeah, I had to, crazy stuff. You know, I had, I mean, there was like, it was, it was really hardcore. And, and Adam, who's the CTO, um, is a really, really bright guy and, and really understands blockchain. And, um, you know, it was a microservices backend that was not like you needed to run Docker in order to run this thing. Um, yeah. And I like had, like, they didn't have a policy where they would give you a machine that was running Linux and there wasn't, their version of stuff at that time, which was this is early, early days, like you could not get it to run on Mac. So I had to go 
like dual boot my personal MacBook Pro and like figure all this stuff out. And, you know, um, so that was a really intense time. And I learned a lot, a lot, a lot. And I really studied Bitcoin. And, you know, the, the blockchain is in many ways a lot like banking, right? That's why the whole DeFi movement is a thing, right? Um, so I really got into banking and, and enterprise um, through that time. And, and during that time, my friend and, and co-founder, uh, Nathaniel, um, and I just started hanging out and he knew that I had, I had won like a bunch of hackathons while I was at full stack. Like that was kind of my brand. I was like, let's go do, you know, the, the betterment hackathon or, or whatever. Yeah. Um, and he had sort of seen that and we were really good friends and he wanted to start a company and I wanted to start a company. And so, you know, I, I ultimately, even though I was learning a, a ton at Symbian, like I, I wanted to do my own thing. Right. And, and that was very much why I went to full stack. I didn't really know how that was going to materialize, but it seemed like, yeah, like Nathaniel's got some experience. He's just been running a company um, of his own that, that did very well. And like now I can strike out with him and, and we'll try and do something together. Nice. Um, I guess you you joined a blockchain company. I think about it in the first age of 20,000 Bitcoin. Um, when so it, it was like you know i think bitcoin had hit close to twenty thousand at that time and then now of course it's back but i feel, I feel like now all the all the bitcoiners from that time feel like old timers like they're but, like yeah this was this was actually before the twenty thousand spike by the time i saw like okay, I, okay. yeah so this was bitcoin was at like eight 100 500 like it was making moves oh i see okay okay so this was way earlier than yeah, that okay this was earlier than than the big spike um so the first 20 000, okay i see okay um i guess that was in what 2018 or something like the previous twenty thousand spike um, yeah like 2018 2017 this was back in yeah 20, people are like oh that was a bubble like right now yeah. this is like you know <laughs> now like the values have corrected yeah now so it was it was exciting. It was really exciting. I yeah. loved, I loved knowing something that I loved. Like blockchain was probably like my first technical like love affair. It was like oh man, like I can actually understand. Now I don't understand as as well as I used to. But there was a point where I was like, all right, cool. Like I understand how this works, and like that's kind of powerful and, and interesting. Um, no, it felt it felt like the future, and it had not it had not been democratized, right? Even today, people don't know blockchain. I think that well it's underlying technical foundation so it still feels like it has some kind of secret but the idea of bitcoin now is i think definitely in the um definitely spread to kind of the common common knowledge um but yeah. you know i'd love to get your thoughts because it, it, i i you know we meet a lot of people who want to start a company and it's always hard to tell you know because of course there's they so you know if there are big financial rewards for successful people who start companies but i always tell people that i didn't do it for the financial rewards i almost did it because i felt like a sickness inside of me that i needed to do it right and it sounds like when you, when you talk about it I, I hear a similar illness affliction upon you um i'm, I'm curious like did you is that how you think about it or are there other ways like if, if i'm talking to a someone who wants to be a founder how do you tell them like like why you did it because i i my only mental model is that like look i just could not do it yeah, I I was actually reading um, a Paul Graham article like a couple of days ago called like Billionaires Build or something, and yeah. it's said about like what makes a good founder and like the whole YC process and and whatever is designed to find these people. And it's like what actually like people think that founders are like exploitative or or like they're like psychopaths or or something. But what actually makes a good founder is like a desire to make money a desire to seem cool and a genuine interest in solving the problem. That's what Paul Graham says. I think I would add on to that, like a complete mental illness about like really like wanting to make this thing work. Um, yeah. And I think that both me and my co-founder Nathaniel and, and my other co-founder Raj, like we all have that. Um, that is one of the personality traits that we, that we uh, have in common. So, there are times when we drive each other crazy, but like we also know that that the struggle is the struggle is real. Like you want to push and push and push, and um, even when you achieve things that you would have thought two years ago is like oh like that's success. Like we're now successful. Like you're happy for 
half a day or like yeah. 30 minutes. And then it's like, all right, everything is totally screwed up and we need yeah. to go continue to, to fix things. Yeah, no, I, I, I think the word, yeah. it's like a compulsion, right? To like make an impact. <laughs> yeah, it's somewhat, it's somewhat compulsive. Yeah. That's also why it's, I think, emotionally draining. I think it's that that it is that there are just highs and lows that um, that hit you, which I think in a normal job, it's just much more stable, like your life. OK, maybe you get a promotion in six months or at the end of the year. But like you're not like every week, like something crazy is happening um, one way or the other. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely a it's definitely a lifestyle choice, uh, but I the, the other thing I think I think the the thing that that I didn't say that that struck me about Paul Graham is he said an unwillingness to work for other people, and that actually kind of I think drives like my own compulsion a little bit. Like mm. I've just never been happy working for another person. Um, like it's always felt like just constraining a little bit and always kind of led my life down a path where like i don't i'm not like fully engaged in, in what i'm doing um so i think that's another another trait like some people just really don't want to do that um yeah, yeah i think david and i talk about this sometimes like i like like maybe <laughs> maybe i shouldn't say this but like like i think we'd make terrible employees you know i'm not sure <laughs> like, i'm not sure how good we would be as employees um but anyway, i think, I think that's the different yeah I, you know, and one thing I love to hear, because a lot of times people say, you know, I really want to do something, but it's hard for me to come up with an idea. And I look at, you know, Mantle, and I think it's, I'm just curious how you guys found this space. It seems like a, um, you know, a customer that wouldn't necessarily be obvious to most entrepreneurs, right? The, um, so maybe you, you can give a quick explanation of, of what you guys do at Mantle. And I'd love to hear how you guys come to this idea. Were there pivots involved? Did you see this immediately or... Um, how did you guys get started here? Yeah, so the, the the one sentence version of what Mantle is, is Mantle is Shopify, but for banks, right? So Shopify helps stores sell things online, helps them manage their inventory, gives them a point of sale system, like all of the technology that you might need to have to be a small retail store. Shopify has a solution for you, right? For a, a very reasonable price and can help you compete with Amazon. Mantle does that exact same thing, except for small and medium-sized banks and, and credit unions, right? Um, and so you can see the, the analogies in the business, like it's, it's right there, like there's your business model. It's, it's monthly recurring revenue, like your customers are, are much larger institutions than, than Shopify, but, and they have like crazy technology requirements. So it's, it's more intense on a features level and a what you need to do, but way less intense on a scale level, right? Way fewer people are trying to apply for bank accounts on a given day than trying to buy something um, in a store and you're gonna have way fewer customers. Um, and it's definitely not an idea that we came up with like on our couch. Uh, we didn't have this idea. This was the result of a pivot. So, you know, what Nathaniel and I um, set out to do at the beginning was we, we looked around at our at our friends and, and our own situation financially and we were like it's crazy that we're reasonably smart people like we've gone to these schools like we're, we're well educated but like neither of us like nathaniel's way way better and, and actually very good at it but like i was like i don't really know what to do with my money and we looked around at our friends who were becoming lawyers and even in finance and like they did not know what to do with their money so we wanted to use technology to build a better bank, like a bank that would, if you had an account at that bank, that bank would actually help you know what to do with your money. Um, so it was kind of a simple idea. Uh, it was kind of like Mint and, and whatever. And we started with our sort of V1 of that, which was just aggregating a lot of your financial data, helping you understand how much you're spending and, and, and stuff like that. We got into the Techstars Accelerator program in, in New York City. Um, got a bunch of users, raised a seed round off of this idea. This was all not Mantle. This was called MyFin, which has now become Mantle. Um, and that was like a challenger bank thing, kind of like a simple bank. Um, there are a lot of banks out there that, that are trying to do this a little bit. And after we raised the seed, we looked around and we were like, all right, it's time to add real banking functionality to our sort of personal finance app. Um, and 
how do you do that? <laughs> like that was the question. It's like, okay, how do you put an account in the app? Like how do you move money? How do you do all this stuff? And we realized that you need to either be a bank or have a banking or, or have a banking partner. Being a bank means acquiring a banking license. And that's basically very, very difficult, very, very expensive. SoFi right now, which is a huge fintech companies. Like I think they've, they've got it. I think Lending Club has like got one. Like there's various giant fintech companies who are able to do it, but not for a small one. You could have so, a banking charter. Yeah, you need to have a banking yeah. charter, right? So it's, it's really difficult to obtain. You have to have a lot of funding, a lot of expertise. So just imagine just, like the, the sitcom version of this is like, what if we were just a bank? Dude, we got to be a bank. Like, let's do that. No, that is actually, <laughs> actually we, were thinking, <laughs> we were thinking, we were talking with, I forget, we were talking with someone somewhere in upstate New York about maybe doing this thing where we were going to like do accounts for children, like education accounts, like some kind of like version of this where we started with like an education account for, for kids and then, and then um, grew it from there. But we were like sitting on the porch and again, I, like I forget who said it to who, but one of us turned to the other and said, dude, we just gotta, we gotta build a bank. Like we have to build a bank. That was actually what it was. Um, and so that was the fire that, that ignited, um, that ignited my fan and like, we looked around at the space and trying to find banking partners. We had conversations with like 50 different banks and they all have, you know, VP of, of digital or digital strategy or, or whatever who would talk to us and, and maybe want to work with us as a fintech company. Um, we found a number of banks who were willing to give us high interest savings accounts and we would have to figure out how to actually do that technically, but on a business level, they would give us the deal. One bank, which is a community bank in Boston, Radius Bank, um, we really fit in with their kind of like the people there and they were willing to do the deal. They had done some similar stuff with similar companies, but at that time we, through talking to them, like we, we just discovered that we were like, well, what else are you doing as a bank? Like, what does a bank do? And they were like, well, we have an eight month long project. It's going to be really, really expensive to redo our account opening. Right. We want to redo our online account opening because it doesn't convert people well and we need to grow. So we need to spend money on marketing and then we need to have pipes that actually take people through and, and automate this stuff. And we were just like, all right, walk us through like what your what your process is. And through doing that, you know, we really were like, man, there's a, a real opportunity here. Right. Like we could do a way better trip, like even the company that is going to come in and, and help them with this, like we can build something faster from scratch that would do a better job. And we were walking home through Central Park one night and we kind of just said, should we just go B2B? Like, should we just change the idea and serve this market? And we decided to, to jump in head first. And like that first thing that we built in partnership with Radius really became like, it's not a new product, but it's a 10 X product. Like it really increased their numbers and it really, did a much better job at automation and a much better job at talking to their core banking system. And they were very happy. And in the banking world, like it's very close knit, like the executives of one bank talk to another bank, talk to another bank. And it sort of grew um, like that. Uh, that's a really cool. Cause so I guess my mental model of this is that if I, if I want to open a CD account, right. And I go to like synchrony bank, so they they have the resources to build that online portal. I can go account. I can transfer funds in. But you're saying if I'm a community bank, that might be a nine to twelve month project. I have to spend half a million dollars on it. It's a lot of money for a community bank. You guys help them get that all that infrastructure all online uh, yeah. to do it. Or yeah. So typically, community banks and credit unions, um, you know, they do not have internal like application development departments. They have a, a totally vendorized approach. So they will hire, you know, the equivalent of a ThoughtWorks um, if it's going to be a custom build, or they'll hire some company like Mantle to go build out a piece of their stack. Um, mm. The competitors that exist that are kind of like Mantle in that they offer some piece, you know, they're typically incumbents. These are products that were built like 20 years ago and People don't charge very much for them. It's just like, oh, you want to open up accounts? We have this thing. It kind of works. Like, you can have it for free. Just use our core banking system, right? Just stay within the network of using our main piece of technology, which is the thing that keeps track of people's money. Like, core banking systems are 
the pre-blockchain ledger in many ways, right? Um, and so that's what these large multi-billion dollar companies sell to these banks. They sell the core banking systems. They don't care so much about account origination. We said, let's build a really good way for banks to originate accounts online because that will help community banks grow and compete with the Bank of Americas of a world of the world. And like we were successful in doing that. We took a fintech approach to all right, if we were a fintech company trying to grow and trying to build the slickest onboarding flow using the most automation and whatever, let's just build that. But we will build it in such a way that it is skinnable and white labelable and configurable to the needs of, of a community bank or credit union. Yeah, that's I think that's such great mm. advice in the sense that um, these companies you're talking about, these you know that selling, um, they are. They're using this account origination as like a loss leader, which means that they invest into it, like a or like a, a commoditized part of their business, right? Can you go and put a make it into a revenue generator part of their business? But then, um, and talking to these, because what I find fascinating is that like the idea came from talking with these customers. Um, I think this is just, this is such great advice, right? Just go talk to to real businesses, and they have so many problems rather than trying to sit around thinking about the problems that you know, um, like. We, we had a lot of students that like I sit around and talk about, and then for some reason, event event sites are always popular, right? Because young people have like are are check splitting, and I'm like, these are not really world changing. Yeah, I had a check splitting idea that I called mm-hmm. that I I built um, with my friend Prairie and my friend Adam, and it I mean it didn't go anywhere, but we had like a Android app that would split a check. Like, yeah, these are the ideas, like or like roommate like, expense. Friends, yeah, like they're in the zeitgeist and they're because they're somewhat obvious. They're the problems that, that you have. Um, it's it does, planning. Yeah, it gets, it gets really interesting when you start talking to people who are operating on behalf of large institutions, right? Any any large institutions because they have problems and, and they have money to solve those problems. And, you know, running a company and, and, I'm, and you guys running full stack, like, there's all kinds of problems that you have that you pay lots of money in SaaS to, to, to different companies, but it's not perfect. Like there's, there's way, way, way a lot of room for more, especially in industries that are typically underserved um, by technology, banking being, being one of them, uh, you know? Yeah. I think what's interesting is that like you as a listener, you have to be a good listener of, translating the problems that they that you're you're getting from whoever you're talking to and really thinking about what solution you know they would want to buy in in response because some problems they may not even you know a they may not be problems that are um either solvable by tech or problems that they're willing to pay money to solve they just may be annoyances um and so i think you you really found one that that um, and also it sounds like you solve some real technical problems to make it happen too. So it's not just the the problem discovery, but you did some uh, you know some like really deep tech to integrate into their these like archaic old banking systems, um, which not anybody off the street could just do. Yeah, I mean it's it's we're we're really good at adapter patterns uh, at Mantle, uh, and like. We have a technology that we call the Core Wrapper API, which is a proprietary piece of technology that basically abstracts away the complexities of performing input output operations against most of the commercially available banking cores that are around, right? So the Mantle system can say, hey, go create a person, go create an account, go link those two entities, go give me the balance on this account, give me the transactions, and it's just speaking mantle system language and all of that translation adaptation, both on like some of these things speak over XML, some of them speak over slash delimited strings, some of them speak over TCP, some of them speak over HTTP. Sometimes you need to go through a VPN, sometimes you don't. Like all of those things are very, like they're just completely abstracted away. And that has a lot of value that right now is powering our account opening product, but in the future, like, that's going to power a lot more stuff and and APIs for external fintech companies. Um, banks are sitting on a a very valuable API market. Like they have this core banking system, and and there's a huge movement in banking as a service to try and allow banks to unlock revenue streams. There's a huge technical problem where 
they have this core banking system, but they don't have any APIs that anyone can understand or integrate with. And so that's one thing that Mantle's kind of building up to over, over time as we expand um, the functionality of the platform. One thing that, um, to take a step back before Mantle, Ben, actually, like something that a lot of people ask David and I is, like, how's your experience at, at YC? And like, you know, would you do it again? You know, what are your thoughts about it? I'm, I'm curious about a similar question about Techstars, because I think we, you know, it's a very kind of parallel, slightly different model. I mean, very different model than YC itself, but still the same same idea. And so, you know, being a founder through that, um, how is that experience? Like, what would you recommend to others? Techstars is great. Um, I think it's it's a really great program. Uh, there's a lot of resources that you get in addition to the funding that you get um, by being admitted. Uh, I think, you know, like you have to, if you're a first time founder, I think it's immensely valuable. Um, like people are like, oh, I, you know, I'm a first time founder. I don't want to give up the equity. Like you, you need as much help as you can possibly get. And you need to be mentored by as many smart people as you possibly can get to listen to you and, and give you advice. Um, and so I think Techstars is, is really great for that. You know, would I do it with my second company? It sort of depends. Um, but I definitely think for, for first time founders, uh, it's it's really good and, and they'll train you on fundraising. They'll provide you know you access to industry experts. Like as you guys are saying, like talking to people who are going to be potentially your customers is hugely valuable. The Techstars network is immense and you can talk to like one of the first things they did is they were like, write down the first the 15 people that you want to talk to. It can be anyone in the world, right? Um, and so so we did that and that was very helpful um, for us to just kind of gain that that knowledge that we wouldn't have otherwise been able to, to have. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I think I think we'd probably have similar thoughts about um, like about the YC and probably accelerator programs in general because they seem to be you know very valuable when you need to get your feet set and and also get your life you know oriented around uh, starting the company rather than having to convince kind of everybody that you're doing something that that needs a lot of focus. Yeah, it, it also like it's it's I mean, YC and, and Techstars, it's like, hey, mom, like, I'm going to do Y Combinator, like, you might not know what that is. But like everyone like enough people in your life know what that is, that it's like a big enough deal that it's like, okay, cool. Like, it gets you in that right mindset where you just shut everything else out and, and you go for it, um, which which you need in the first until you have product market, which you need all the time, but really until you have product market fit, like you, you need to be blinders on. Yeah. So Ben, um, sorry, Dave, did you, were you going to say something? Yeah. I mean, I'd love to hear, cause you know, you talked about adapter pattern. I feel like one thing, um, a lot of, um, I mean, CS grads and bootcamp grads struggle with is thinking about, I would say like, you know, these enterprise design patterns, system architecture, um, how have you kind of grown yourself in that area and um, and learned that stuff? Uh, you know, I, I think if you want to, like, full stack is, is amazing. I, so I had a little bit of an advantage just having done some computer science in in college and, and having built some, some things with, you know, just built different types of things that interacted with, with hardware and, and whatever. Um, but you you have to just like I think there's this notion that you like go to a boot camp you get your first good job and then like the mentorship rails in that job are gonna like help you become what you want to be and that's a, a way to to go about your life um, but you know that's not the pace that I wanted to do and so I just have s stacks of books on software architecture, right? Like software architecture is not this thing that like you can't just learn by yourself, right? Like you you can just read domain driven design, read, you know, Joel on software, read patterns of enterprise architecture. Like it's all out there. You just have to get through it. And it really, I think I had the advantage of doing all of that reading on my own. I also had the tech stars network and all the technical mentors there. And then it was, it's it's kind of like great to actually have the problems, 
right? Like if you're a junior or mid-level engineer, like you don't have the kinds of problems that the architecture books are, are really talking about on a day-to-day -day basis because you're trying to, I mean, in a great, in the best case, you're focused on pounding out valuable business logic and delivering that, right? You're not focused on like, how am I going to do this sort of nebulous thing at all? Yeah. Um, so being this sort of CTO who has a sort of academic bend, um, I was able to like merge the, the practice and the sort of academic architecture stuff pretty well. That, and you, you throw out all that out the window to find someone who will pay you and then you raise money and you hire people who are very, very talented and you learn from them and, and you know, pull your head up five years or six years later as it is in my case and, and you've just been doing this for six years. So you're no longer um, a novice at it at all. Yeah, it's it's. Um, I think it's fascinating. What we just said because I think that the, the, those two books you recommended, I you know highly recommend to domain driven design and patterns of enterprise application architecture, right? And and to me, it's it's like it's very hard to understand those books unless you are architect architect detecting systems, right? Because they make no sense to you. But um, a lot of what I think about architecture is architecture is. Um, postponing commitment until as late as possible, right? In terms of design choices. And it's like, that's what it, it sounds like you're describing with your, with your, with Mantle is that the core of the technology is that separate some of the challenging stuff so that as you're designing the upfront things, you can be as flexible as you, as possible, but at the same time, not worry about the underlying um, layer that you're integrating with. And it's a, it's a hard to convey sometimes because the problem is not even clear in people's mind yet who are junior engineers, especially at the big fan companies, right, where a lot of these problems are abstracted away so well with technology is so, you know, so effective that you don't even think about, you know, things like infinite hard drive space. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I joke about adapter patterns. There's all there's all kinds of stuff like, like, I we were faced with this problem where we had three banks that wanted to use our stuff and we had to have a multi-tenant system. I remember there was a full stack assignment for maybe it was like the e-commerce store assignment, um, stack store or something like that, uh, where there's a like a an extension to it where you do like make it multi-tenant, right? Make a, a thing that builds stores for a person who wants to have like multiple different stores or something. Um, yeah. Multi-tenancy was like a real business critical thing that I needed to do. And I, and it was either that or split my code base and like have two repos for, for two banks. And that's what a lot of our competitors do. Like they just have like a hundred different repos. Instances that they run, right? And they have separate infrastructure and, and all this stuff. And so I needed to get to true multi-tenancy and all of these sort of things that I was reading really informed that. And then the other real problem we had was we're exactly we're dealing with all this complexity with input output into these legacy systems that are COBOL systems. They don't they they're on mainframes. The database like is not even it's like DB2, right? Like there's no SQL even in it's not like no SQL, like cool no SQL. It's like SQL wasn't around. Um, <laughs> and like, yeah, no. so so like we we just had there was a glaring problem in my face and and had to figure out how to how to handle that well i've been through like four iterations of it and now we have a whole team building this thing and, and the patterns are established and we actually brought on two full stack grads recently like in the past two weeks that are joining that adapter team right and they take ownership over one adapter and they work with a senior and they kind of like learn the, the pattern and, and grow from there yeah i i I, see, I find myself doing this a lot in like the legal world. Nima calls it blog post, blog post lawyering, where it's like once you have the problem, you start consuming information about this very quickly, right? And then forming your own opinion and then consulting with experts. And then I'll read like you know thirty blog articles on some legal issue, and then that, and then having an expert that can help you guide you through that thinking is super helpful. But um, yeah, the problem oftentimes the, creates the motivation. Yeah. So, so Ben, I'd, I'd love to um, hear from you more about like, you know, what kind of advice would you have for somebody who is, you know, let's start with somebody who's entering the bootcamp. 
Um, and maybe many of those folks are actually going to be watching this. Um, like, what kind of advice would you have for, for those folks? Um, I, I think that, like, it, it kind of goes back to what you were saying about YC and, like, it being a good time to, to kind of throw away a lot of your life and, and just focus on, on one thing. Um, that's definitely the, the approach that I took. Like, I was very militant about, I showed up early, I stayed really late. Like, I just was like, this time is the time that I am going to make myself into someone who can build a technology company. And I need to like learn modern web development. I need to, you know, learn that entire stack. I need to like learn how to interact with, with other engineers and, and do all this stuff. So there's a certain like full stack is really fun and, and people are silly and it's a, it's a good culture. And, and I love that part of it. Um, but you also want to like steal yourself for some, for some, for a serious time in your life. Right. And if you can hit both those notes, well, like you don't want to burn yourself out, but mm -hmm. if you balance those things well, like you can really learn quite a lot in a very short amount of time. Um, and so that's one piece of advice. I think the other piece of advice is like, you have to just like accept the fear, right? Like I think a lot of people when they start really programming, like they're like, oh man, like there's a database. It's like on my MacBook. Like how do I connect to it? Like, is this gonna work? Like, am I gonna write this row? Like you have to have a relationship to that fear, um, which is just curious, right? Like a curious mind sort of. Um, and that can really accelerate what's going on because it relieves frustration and like it it prevents you from kind of locking up and, and kind of learning a little bit of CSS and then you're the CSS person for the rest of the, the boot camp, right? Like you want to to really get get curious and not be afraid of the machines. They're not gonna break. Like worst case, you need a new MacBook, like if you really fry something. But um yeah. It's reminded of that Zoolander. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, the <laughs> database is in the computer. It's like, yes. <laughs> um, I mean, that's a lot of like you do in preparation for boot camp. Like you do a lot of like silly stuff, like you know, not silly, but like looping inside of a loop and iterating over a list, and it's all in an IDE. And so you you get hung up on like how does this stuff actually work, you know, in an operating system sense, and like what the hell is an operating system actually anyway? And that is hard for people um so don't don't be afraid of that lean into that um yeah. because that's that's a lot of it right like ultimately like if you're doing a lot of looping multiple times over different lists to do different things like your your architecture is probably not that good right like a lot of it is pre-planning put this thing in a database get it out it's emitting events react to the events and, and, and like that I think it's, it's those are two great pieces of advice, and I, I think oftentimes I, I tell students like the um, your computer is so much more powerful than even you can imagine it, right? Like they're they're concerned about like looping over a hundred thousand items. And I'm like, your screen is drawing 4K at 60 hertz, like without blinking an eye, right? So don't even. Um, yeah, don't like that type of optimization is we we I finally a couple of days ago got to like a real hardcore engineering rubric like because we have enough people at mantle now who are engineers who like we need to have like actual like l1 l2 l3 and, and you get more senior so we actually have a real rubric and, and was very sure to put at the level one it's like do not over optimize over silly stuff right yeah. like do not get caught up in in spending your time doing performance optimizations until you have a performance problem right like you don't know that you have, like, you think you have a performance problem, but you don't have one until you're actually noticing it in, in some way. Yeah. And so, um, and then, and then following up to that, like, what would you, uh, how would you advise, you know, there are, there's always a crop of uh, full stack graduates who are really interested in pursuing entrepreneurship. Um, um, even many times during their capstone project, but very often after they graduate and sometimes while they're in their first or second job. Um, and so like, what kind of tips would you have for them? I think, you know, there's some unique aspects to your background that, that would apply to them. A lot of that you, um, that, you know, that, that you, you were an engineer that, that, uh, came through a boot camp, 
and you um, you tried a bunch of things. And um, so, yeah, I mean, would you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think the biggest mistake that I was guilty of for a while and that I see other people with engineering backgrounds who want to be, you know, um, who want to be entrepreneurs, it's like, you think that like you're going to write a bunch of code and, and then you're going to have this thing and then that's going to be the company, right? That's not efficient. Like you, you can work really hard and, and build like a bunch of little apps, but like, that's just not like probably no one is, is going to use them. Like you need to figure out a good business idea first. And that involves talking to people, talking to your customers, figuring out who your customers are and then figuring out like, okay, can I market something to them and get them to like, give me their email for an email list to validate that this thing is something that, that they actually want, right? And all of the engineering stuff, all of the database design, all of the like, what the front end is gonna look like and to a large extent, what the thing specifically even is, you will figure out after you have gotten that momentum, right? Like. The first step, I think, in, in starting something is building traction, building momentum, seeing like, does this appeal to people? Cool. 15,000 people gave me their email address. I've, I've, I'm onto something, right? Like, let's build the smallest thing that, that I can kind of give to them to, to get to the next step, as opposed to like, build the whole thing and then, well, I guess there were no, there were no users. Like, I didn't build the right thing. Yeah. It's the, uh, it's the worst lesson from, that movie, Field of Dreams, right? Build it and they will come. Yeah. You have, I mean, Unfortunately, ghosts don't pay, don't help you with revenue growth. Yeah. So. Build it, I think build it and they will come. Like there's, there is truth. Like Mantle is doing a lot. Like Mantle, that's what we do. Like we think we really understand our customers and, and we say, we're going to build this thing for the next eight months, right? Like th this is an eight month build and MVP is hard in the banking world. Like you don't have MVPs traditionally. So we do a lot of build it when they were come, but it comes from a deep understanding of the customer base and having prior success with a smaller thing. Like you can't just start out. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I think that that's a, um, I think that's, that's a good note to, to finish up on. Um, ben, we uh, you know really appreciate you spending the time with us here, and also um, you know are are proud to have you as a part of the full stack community. You're you're really uh, you know doing well. We're always rooting for Mantle, um, uh, and and you in in general. So uh, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much, Ben. It's great to hear about your success and uh, and the work that you guys are doing. Thank you, guys. Really, really appreciate it, and appreciate what you do with, with full stack, it, it changes people's lives for sure. Great. Thank you. All right.